first of all, I want to thank Asia and the Worcester Senior Center for having me come and speak with you today. I'm thrilled to be doing this. And um, I'd also like to thank you for being here because I know I stand between you and entertainment and lunch, but I know that you know, the information we're going to talk about is, can be really useful to you and can keep you safe. And it's all about prevention, right? So I'm Jill Terrian. I am the Associate Dean um, at the UMass Qian Medical School. I work in the Tian Ching Fen Graduate School of Nursing. Um, I've been there quite a while and I teach basically people to be nurse practitioners. I'm an adult primary care nurse practitioner and my background includes working in oncology, internal medicine, uh, women's health, and most currently, the Graduate School of Nursing runs the student health services at Worcester State University, and I manage that contract and work in that clinic on Mondays as a nurse practitioner. So um, that's a little bit about me, and um, I'd like to just, you know, we have to talk about any conflicts of interest. I actually work for, um, I speak for PrimeMed, which is a primary care company, and I do podcasts on primary care. And I also am a speaker on women's health for GlaxoSmithKline, which both of those have nothing or anything to do with today. But I just want to be um, as clear as possible. So a few objectives for today, right? I'm a teacher, so I always have to have objectives. You're my class. And so I want to talk about fall prevention as it, re as it relates to your eyes, your sight, your hearing, and your balance. Um, also talk about practical information and resources to enhance your safety. Um, the first thing I want to say is thank you for coming today because coming to the Worcester Senior Center means you're engaged. You're engaged socially and that you want to, you know, have those connections. And that's really, really important. And I have to say, I live in Leicester, and uh, my mom went to the Leicester Senior Center for many years. And so between going to Leicester and coming here, this Worcester Senior Center provides such vibrant and, many, and such great programming for you. So really, I'm so glad that you take advantage of it, because it's very, very important. So we talked already about who I am and what I do. And, um, but what I'd like to know, I have a copy of the series that Asia was just talking about. And I know I'm the next to the last in the series, but I look at the topics and I feel like a few of the things I'll talk about will, t will be redundant and tie it together for you. So, you know, what, what are some of the big takeaways that you've had? And I realize I don't have a microphone in the audience, but what have you learned that you've taken away from this? You can just shout it out. Stay off ladders. Stay off ladders, absolutely. Watch the stairs, absolutely. Anything else? Those are great. And so we'll talk about a few more. Common things that can really put you in the hospital and cause injury that you can maybe make some subtle changes and, and make improvements. So what are you hoping to learn today? You know we're gonna talk about sight, hearing, balance, and your feet. What do you wanna hear about? Balance, we'll talk about that. Anything else, what else do you wanna to learn today? Okay, well I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about a few things. And it'll be great. So I also want to just say it's okay if somebody has a question, please raise your hand. Um, I can answer questions throughout. We'll also have a few minutes at the end for questions and answers also. So, you know, what about eyes, ears, and feet? Well, you know, when I thought about it, when Asia asked me to speak, you know, you think about the different senses that you have available to you and how important they are just for your everyday life and your, and your safety. So we'll delve a little bit deeper into that. So we're gonna start at the top. We're gonna talk about the eyes first. And you know, we know that there's changes that happen that we, we cannot control. There's things that we can do to prevent eye changes, but some of it just happens naturally with aging. So we have cur the curvature of the lens of the eye. I'm gonna show you a picture of anatomy in a second. Um, Cataracts. Who's had cataract surgery? 
All right. It's pretty. It's very, very common. Um, and then we know that our eye muscles weaken. Weaken. We have nerves and muscles around our eyes that help with the shape and the formation for you to keep your eye health in good condition. Um, things that happen when you know that your eyes are changing it happened to me. I'm going to be 63 in July. And I can tell you, almost at age 50, I started to notice I was holding the book like this, a little bit closer to me. I was having, you know, I'm starting to see that at nighttime, you know, I just went and got my prescription changed about six months ago because I was noticing at night I was having diff a little bit of difficulty. Things didn't look as clear. And um, also, you know, sometimes your vision off to the side, that can be a clue that that's called peripheral vision out to the sides is not as keen as it used to be. And these are all clues that, you know, maybe you need to go and have an updated eye exam. And sometimes they can happen really quick or they can happen slowly over time. What can we do for prevention and for wellness? And so basically, they recommend an eye exam yearly. Um, and that, you know, if you wear contact lenses, which I have worn contact lenses since I was 15, um, that I absolutely have to go in Massachusetts yearly to have my eyes examined or I can't get my contact lenses refilled. That's a Massachusetts law. Um, but also for glasses. And I know many of us, we have bifocals and trifocals and we have so many options for um, glasses and to improve our sight. So it's really important that you stay up to date. Oftentimes, how many of you gone, have gone years without any changes in your, yeah? That can be pretty common. And then all of a sudden, you can have a year where you go and you've had some noticeable changes. So really important that you have an exam yearly. Um, other things that contribute to our eyesight and uh, diabetes and high blood pressure or hypertension. Those are two conditions that can be pretty common. You wanna make sure that you are being managed and that you have your conditions under control. It really plays an important role in everything we're gonna talk about today. Um, always stop smoking, easy to say, but not easy to do. Um, but smoking causes a lot of vascular changes, changes in our blood vessels. And it's really important that um, even if you can cut down um, on your way to quitting, all of that is beneficial. It's never too late. Exercise, we're gonna talk a little bit about that at the end. I have a handout that I've given to you and we're gonna review those handouts. Um, but exercise of any sort, how many of you come here and do an exercise class? Excellent, excellent, keep doing that. Um, so I have, I actually, I know I told you I'm gonna be 63, so I'm the baby of the family. So I have brothers that are 82, 81, 77, and one of them um, goes to Florida in the winter. And so I go down and I visit him um, when he's down there. And I go to his Tai Chi classes with him. They have at his center where he lives. And I really enjoy them. So any movement, any exercise can really be beneficial. And I've, there are studies that show that even if you do exercise 10 minutes a day, it can make a difference in your health. So don't think, you know, I'm only doing a little bit of exercise. It really helps and it can have a cumulative effect. If you start exercising and you only do a couple minutes a day and you increase every day or you just do it a couple times a day to get more minutes in, it all counts. So don't think that you're not helping yourself by doing any amount of exercise. Sunglasses, we are getting into the bright sun of summer. So it's really important to wear sunglasses so that you don't have to squint. Um, and so if you don't have a pair of sunglasses, you wanna get some. I wear them year round because I w if any of you wear contacts, you know that the light is filtered a little bit differently. And so having um, sunglasses really stops me from squinting. It's, you're very more light sensitive when you wear contacts. Um, protective eyewear. You know, if you are working, uh, I know many people do woodworking, or they work with, you know, or they use a hammer and things might splinter. Really important that you wear protective eyewear. A quick story, my husband is a, um, 
is a retired sheet metal worker, and so he worked a lot with metal, and he was cutting metal one day. He was not wearing protective eyewear, and he felt something go into his eye, but he didn't know quite what it was. Well, it ended up being a piece of metal, and by nighttime that night, he had a lot of eye pain. So he had to go to uh, the emergency room, and luckily they had an ophthalmologist that came in, but he had a piece of metal that lodged in his eye, and it formed a rust ring. And so, yeah, so he didn't have to have like surgery, but he had to have the tissue, because your eye is a very self-healing organ. And so what he had to do is go every day for two weeks and have the tissue scraped until the metal could be removed. So I know that sounds awful. They had to numb his eye. It was, it was awful. Believe me, he learned the hard way. Protective eyewear is really important. So just to you know, show you, you know, a few of the areas, this is not meant to be an anatomy test at all today. But you know, here is your eye, and what happens is, with changes that happen is that with your pupil, which is right in the front, it, the diameter decreases, so it gets smaller. And the lens starts to form cataracts, and some of them form earlier than others. Some of it can be genetic that you have cataracts a lot earlier um, than others. Um, if you've ever been on steroids for any length of time, that can precipitate uh, the cataracts forming earlier. Um, vitreous humor, which is the big orange area, is like a, a gel liquid. Um, it turns from a gel to a liquid, and what happens is a retina can become detached. And what that does is it definitely changes your vision noticeably, and you have to go and have a procedure done. Um, so as we also age, if you look at the macula, um, the, it says the receptors generate and die, and it causes a loss of central vision. Some of you have, may have heard the term macular degeneration, and what that looks like, I was gonna put a picture up, but I forgot to, is that if you are looking ahead, you might not see the center of the picture, but you see everything around, all right? And that's a clue that you've got some degeneration going on and you'd wanna get seen. Any questions before we move on to the ears? Everybody doing okay? All right, great, okay. So we know that anybody 75 years and older, about half have hearing loss. Some of this happens slowly over time. The technical term for that is presbycusis. And I should have told you with the eyes, the medical term for changing in vision um, is presbyopia. Um, so, what happens is you might be a person that has gradual loss of hearing in both ears over time. So it's really slow and you're not really noticing it. Some people do have a very quick type of hearing loss and it might be in relation to a process going on in their ear. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, why does this happen? Well, it's really complex. and. They have ch there's changes that happen in your middle ear and your inner ear, and the nerve pathways basically are decreased or diminished that send the signal to the brain for the hearing. And that's acoustic nerve eight that we're usually talking about. Much is unknown about hearing loss. I mean, I'm sure that some of you could think about, you know, well, if I listen to loud so sounds without um, protection, ear protection over years, like people that worked in machine shops and, you know, did different things where loud noises were common, motors, airplanes, things like that, anything loud, banging, um, you know, can cause changes over the time. But they don't really know a lot about hearing loss. Can you prevent it? Well, just by, you know, wearing uh, hearing protection, mowing the lawn or doing anything that's loud, wearing your hearing protection. And that could be using headphones or it actually could be using um, earplugs um, or anything like that. Basically, we already talked about long-term exposure from loud noises. Those people are at risk. Toxic drugs, and it's not like you can, uh, you know, if you have to have chemotherapy, some of them do have a side effect of, of affecting the nerves of the ears and other nerves in your body as well, but that can cause hearing loss. 
Also, um, diabetes and high blood pressure or hypertension, which we talked about with the eyes. Really important that these conditions are kept under control and you're visiting your provider, whether that be a physician or a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant um, in primary care, that um, you have these checked regularly. Why are our ears important and also our eyes? driving, right? You need to be able to hear what's happening around you when you drive. Um, also smoke detectors, um, important that you're able to hear them in your home if there's a fire or smoke or carbon monoxide, that you can hear those detectors. You need it for socialization. If you can't hear, you're missing out. And they know there are studies that show that people are lonely when they cannot hear. Yes, there's lonely when you know you lose a partner and you lose your friends and your living situation and social situation changes, but we also know if you can't hear, you can't participate. And it can be very, very difficult. Um, safety, you know, again, hearing. Is there, if you're crossing the road, can you hear and see the car coming? Um, and then balance. Hearing has a lot to do with balance. If you have hearing loss in one ear, it may throw off your balance. So it's really important that if you think you are experiencing hearing issues, that you have um, some tests done to see you know, what is causing it. And we're gonna talk a little bit about prevention um, with your ears. So this is not meant, again, to have a test and you can't see some of the some of the um, words up there, but this is the basic anatomy of the ear. And just so you know, so up here is you know the outer ear area, okay? This is the middle, and this is the inner ear. When you go for a checkup and you've got an ear problem, or you're going for your physical and they look in your ears, basically, all we can see with the, exam, the op, ophthalmoscope that we're using, I mean, the otoscope that we're using, is that we're gonna get that cone into your ear and we're gonna see your tympanic membrane in the, in the um, middle ear. That's as far as we can see. So you can see that there's a much more uh, bigger part of the conduction system of your ear that we cannot see. So sometimes when people have uh, you know, profound hearing loss and it happens suddenly, you might get sent for you know, imaging of your ear because it can show that there's tumors or something that's blocked um, and actually um, there might be something that can be done for that sudden hearing loss. But this picture is really just to show how complex our ear and hearing is. Um, and there's a lot of things when people have hearing loss that we can look into to see if we can improve it. So this is not meant for you to take a test today, but um, the, these are basic questions that um, you know, kind of say, if you answer two or more yeses to these questions, that you probably need to have your hearing checked. So does a hearing problem cause you difficult, difficulty when listening to a TV or a radio? Does a hearing problem cause you difficulty when attending a party? That's thinking about background noise. If there's a lot of noise going on, does it impact your hearing? How about when you, f do you feel frustrated when talking to members of your family? Do they keep asking you to repeat? Or do you have to ask them to repeat because you're not hearing what they're saying? Um, do you feel left out when you're with a group of people because you can't hear what they're talking about? Do you um, have difficulty when visiting friends, relatives, or neighbors? Do you feel challenged by a hearing problem? And do you feel that any difficulty with your hearing limits or hampers your personal or social life? Again, if you can't hear, you can't engage. You're missing, you're missing some of it. Um, do you feel uncomfortable when talking to friends? Does it make you avoid groups of people? Um, and does it cause you to not visit your friends, relatives, or neighbors um, more often than you would rather do that? So anything like that, you might want to have your hearing checked. And one thing that I found, um, so I told you I'm the youngest in my family, so I helped take care of my parents as they were aging. Um, and I noticed that, you know, I'm, I'm a healthcare provider, so I'm pretty upfront about things and ask questions. 
and you know, and I have a lot of knowledge. And I could see, even though my parents were very comfortable with me, it was hard for them to tell me they were having a problem because they didn't want to lose their independence. And that's re real, you know. And I think the goal of every healthcare provider is keep people independent as long as possible. And so take advantage of making sure you look for what you need and ask and communicate with your family members that assist you and with the providers that you visit. Because if you don't, we don't really know how you're feeling. And we can take it. We can. So, um, and we want to help. There's a lot of options for assistive devices for hearing. Um, first of all, it's getting checked. So if you answered yes to two or more of those questions I just went through, think about giving your primary care provider a call and saying, I think I need to have my hearing checked. Um, and what they need to do is really have you in to look at your ears, because you want to check the structures we just talked about. Remember, we can see with a scope into your middle ear um, and just see your tympanic membrane and see what it looks like. Um, but sometimes people have obstructions, wax. It's really common that people have wax. I tell, told you I work in college health at Worcester State University on Monday mornings. I have 20 year olds that have hard, dark wax. It's just some people make more wax than others. And so you wanna make sure that your, your, um, your external ear is clear of wax because that could be causing a hearing problem. Um, and then your um, provider might order a hearing test with an audiologist. Uh, that will test your hearing, or you may need something else like an ear, nose, and throat provider, also called an otolaryngologist. Now that is a word, I'll tell you. I had to practice that a lot when I was in nursing school. Um, hearing aids. You know, many of you in this room, do you, uh, does anybody have a hearing aid? Or maybe you don't want to shift. Thank you. Yes. So, and they, are, they come in types now. Now, since 2022, there are hearing devices, hearing aids that are available over the counter at a much reduced cost than the, the hearing aids that are prescription. But you ha I wouldn't spend any money until I had a hearing test and you know what you need. Because uh, if you don't, if you can't use the over-the-counter hearing aids, it would be important to be fitted for the proper type that you need. Um, and then there's cochlear implants. And on the diagram I showed you before, way on the inner ear was your co cochlear. And sometimes people have an implant that's done into their um, skull area that actually has direct connection to the cochlear because they either are devoid of the structures that need to transmit sound from the external ear and through that process, so it comes from the device they put in the skull. Um, and then assistive listening devices. You know, there's closed loop systems on televisions that you can use. Um, the cell phone usually has an amplifying device. And then, you know, sometimes going to the movie theater, they actually have closed loop systems and devices available to improve your experience so you can hear better. All right, so next we're gonna go, we're gonna talk about your feet, right? So we talked about balance, and we know that our feet take a lot of abuse, right? I have never thought that feet were pretty. That's just my personal opinion. But they really are the workhorses of our body. Um, and so what happens is, you know, there's, when we age, there's different changes that happen. Uh, that basically, the, your feet change shape. They can get wider and longer, and it's because of the tendons and ligaments. They can lose their strength and their ability to bounce back. So they get a little flattened out. And I don't know, has anybody noticed that they've had to wear a different shoe size over time? I have, yeah. So um, it's, it's, not, it's just a fact. It's, it's nothing bad, but it's paying attention to, geez, my shoes do not feel the same and they're starting to bother me. So that's a clue you might need to get a different type of shoe. Um, naturally, over time, your arches of your foot flatten. Um, some people are born with flat feet, and that's you know congenital. Um, they've had it since birth. But over time, your arches will flatten. Um, and so what happens again, that will cause the foot shape to change and lengthen. Common foot problems, um, bunions, corns, calluses, hammer toes, ingrown toenails, thickened or discolored nails, 
And then we've already talked about diabetes. Feet are really important in diabetes. And anybody with circulation issues, you know, really important that you check your feet. And then, of course, heel pain. And what I meant to put here overall is just pain. Feet can hurt from arthritis. It can help hurt from prolonged standing. And it can really impair your quality of life. So really important that you pay attention to your feet and, you know, maybe get your, um, it might have to go to your provider and have them checked. Um, if you're not, and just so you can get a second opinion. So this is just a couple of pictures. Some people have bunions, and that's on the picture on the left. You'll notice that um, the greater toe is going, you know, going out to the sides. Some people have one, one foot with a bunion, and others have both. Some people get them repaired and have a really good outcome from it, but it's a pretty, ex you know, it's extensive surgery. Has anybody had a bunionectomy? How was it? It was awful. She says it was awful. And I believe it. I had a friend. She had it done at age um, 67. Um, she had a good outcome, but she had the worst one done and said, I won't have the second one done. I'll live with the second one. But important that you get shoes that you're comfortable in, all right? Um, Corns and calluses, right? So if you look on this picture on the right, you'll notice that on the top of the toes, you've got some shiny areas. That's from rubbing. You know, that means you've got some friction going on in whatever footwear that you have on. And that's not good because it can lead to an open area and it can really be a problem. So you want to pay attention to your feet. It's really important. So how do you want to take care of your feet? We already talked about comfortable footwear. First and foremost, that's very important. Keeping your feet clean and dry, really important, because if you have moisture and you know your shoes get wet, whether it's from a rainstorm or from sweating, um, you want to make sure that you dry them out before you put them on again. Look at your feet, and if you're having trouble getting down, of course, to see the bottom, think about using a mirror. That can help you as well, because you want to look at all aspects of your feet, and you want to look in between your toes as well. Um, special conditions, um, you know, any blood flow problems, vascular problems, and things like that where you have changes in the circulation, because if you think about it, when you get down to your toes, that's the distal part, they're the furthest away from your heart. And so you remember, your blood starts in your heart, it gets pumped all throughout your body, up into your brain, and then back down again. So. Um, really important that if you have any sort of uh, blood flow problems that you look at your feet. Um, it's not good to wear tight shoes um, and, or socks, especially, but if you do have a condition where you have to wear the vascular socks, that's a different story. Um, again, we'll talk about diabetes having it in control because if, it, if your diabetes is out of control and your blood sugar is too high, it can really decrease your vascular flow, your blood flow to your feet. Um, high blood pressure, important for that to be in control. If you think about it, you know, that's the blood hitting the sides of the walls of your veins and your arteries. And so if it hits too much, they get stiff and that's why we take medication, to take it in, um, to put it in a parameter that is acceptable. Um, and then, you know, you've got your provider to look at your feet as well. And then you may need, you know, to uh, be referred to a podiatrist. They do tremendous work uh, trimming nails. Nails can get, you know, thick. And, um, and yellowed and hardened and be really difficult to deal with. But luckily we have podiatry and they will um, help you take care of your feet on a regular basis um, if you can't do it yourself. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about feet and um, prevention. Um, good footwear, really important. Now I see those advertisements for the Good Feet store. Does anybody go there? I don't even know if we have one near us. Shoesbury? Shoesbury? Has anybody been there? Yeah, I haven't gone yet, but I intend to go. You intend to go. That's good. Have you been? It's very expensive. That's the only problem. Very expensive. Now, I know with some conditions, you might get some money off with a prescription, but that's, I, I understand that it can be a cost, so beware of that. If you have family members that want to buy you a gift, 
think about it, but I would go there first and see what they have and see if it's really worth it. Did you buy anything? If you don't mind me asking. So what I'm so what I want to share thank you for sharing that so in her family they have flat feet it's congenital and the store is expensive she has gotten a pair but it hasn't helped as much as what she currently is wearing which is a support in her athletic shoe but her son who's in his 40s went and did get a pair of shoes from the good feet store and it's he felt it's helped and it's helped his back pain as well as his balance and the orthotic, yeah. I recommend that you wear a very good supported shoe. Mm -hmm. That you, when you put it in, it has to be a good supported shoe. Okay, thank you. So they recommend that if you get a support, it has to be in a good shoe, good supportive shoe. So based on that, you know, I would say, well, it's like anything I buy. If I'm trying it out and it's expensive, I want to know if I can return it and what's the policy. No? Uh, you can go back, they, they put you in and there's different levels of support. Okay. Um, you can go back in within a time and change the levels and everything. Uh, I did do that. I went back in and went to a lower level. There's a point at which you know, can't return it. Okay. So it sounds like they try to work with you if you're not satisfied, which that's important too. So I think it's buyer beware, but you know, I think, you know, between going to your provider if you're having foot pain um, and possibly being referred to a podiatrist and then possibly an orthotic shoe or a support is something to look into. So, thank you for sharing all that. Uh, yeah? One other thing I know that insurance will cover some of the products that go with diet. Some insurance is covered. Um, um, so that's a good point. So if you do go to a podiatrist, they also may be able to recommend you. They all use, they all usually know resources that they can send you to, but she's saying if you have a prescription, it can cover, it can cover some of it. So um, thank you very much. Um, be aware of your surroundings. So we had somebody talk about not going on ladders, uh, stairs, being careful of stairs. You want to make sure that you are safe where you walk. You need good lighting, use of lighting. Um, I use my uh, flashlight on my phone all the time um, in restaurants when I can't see and it's kind of dark. And also when I get out of my car and I'm not wearing anything that's lighted, I use my flashlight on my phone. So really important, lighting can help inside your home as well. So as you get up at night, um, and have to go to the kitchen or the bathroom, you want to make sure that you've got night lights or lighting that ha you know, shows your pathway. Really important. Um, if you're like me, I have a cat that likes to play at night, so she pushes her toys in my pathway. Um, sometimes I'm going to get rid of the balls because they almost got me the other day. Um, she had them all over the place. Um, communication with your provider. I talked about this at the beginning, is that you know, sometimes there's, I don't know, people feel ashamed or they don't want to admit, you know, that they need some help. And it's just so important. Usually providers are pretty astute and they're asking you some questions to kind of find out that you're, make sure that you're safe and if there's anything else they can do to make you safer. Um, but, and having your regular checkups is really important. Um, telehealth, has anybody done a telehealth visit? Especially, oh yeah, especially with COVID, right? So. 
um, I had a few telehealth visits, and although they're not laying hands on you, you're at least having a conversation, and they're asking you questions if you're having a problem. So don't shy away from telehealth visits. Massachusetts is keeping those uh, telehealth visits billable right now um, because people have, you know, I have um, nurse practitioner students and friends that work at like Edward M. Kennedy and Family Health Center of Worcester and they found that their patients were not missing appointments if they were able to do a telehealth visit which is really important so they saw their visits stay on track which is really really important so don't be afraid of a telehealth visit um, your independence and safety are always the goals, and it's really important. And we're almost done. We're going to go over the handouts that I brought. Um, these are the three handouts that are at the table. Um, what you can do to prevent falls, check for safety, and a quick chair rise exercise that you can do. And again, I cannot stress more that any exercise is helpful for strength and balance, and moving is important think about it. Um, we do know if you are not moving as much as you used to for various reasons that some of your muscles will contract and kind of, can kind of have a little bit of a bent over and um, you know not uh, posture that so any type of exercise is going to help you with your posture. Um, it's really important and it's important for your function. Um, so just to I'm just going to briefly go over this handout I, I gave out to you. But, um, you know, falls can be prevented by simple things. And the four things that you can do, which is right on the front here, is have your health care provider review your medicines. We know that some medicines are not, if you go to multiple providers, sometimes the health systems do not talk. And one provider may not know that you're on a medicine that interacts with another that could make you sleepy, that could cause some side effects, that might put you at risk of falling. So it's really important that um, your health care provider review your medications at every visit. Exercise to improve your balance and strength. As I said, any exercise counts, and it can be done in two minute intervals five times a day if you want to do 10 minutes. And then make your home safer, all right? So it goes on the inside, on the second page, um, it goes a little bit um, into further um, detail on those four points. But we talked about Tai Chi and movement, chair exercises, um, of which I have one in the final page of your hand, handout. Um, have your eyes and feet checked at your visits. And then for making your home safe, of course, clearing the path. You don't want to have anything in the path of where you're walking. You don't want to walk in the dark. Talk, you know, you want to do the lighting. Um, install handrails that are going to help you out in your shower area, next to your toilet. Um, I can tell you that um, three and a half years ago, my husband and I decided to move and build a retirement home. And we can essentially live on one floor. That's really important. We don't have to do stairs. Of course, we do do stairs now. But when it comes a time when we can't, everything can be done on one floor. My laundry is in my half bath. Um, our shower is uh, zero, what do they call that? It's got no stair. You just, you could roll right in. Um, we haven't put the handrails up, but we will when we, you know, before we need them. Um, and so everything is really easy, large door frames and things like that. Um, so you want to make it safe. The second handout is check for safety, and that's home fall prevention. And so you've got a little, on the second page, it talks about um, a checklist. So it talks about indoor and outdoor steps, your floors, your kitchen, bedrooms, and bathrooms. So you want to take advantage and maximize your safety. Um, because falls are not a normal part of aging. And that's really important to realize. So I hope those handouts help you. The last page is a chair rise exercise, which you can just sit towards the front of a sturdy chair with your knees bent flat on the floor, kind of like you have handles on this, these chairs. Well, some of them do and some of them don't. You can do it either, either way. And basically, breathing in and breathing out and, and pausing and also trying to you know, lift yourself up out of the chair 
um, is important. I don't know if any of you have had a get up and go test, uh, but you know, if you've uh, had some balance issues, your provider might have had you sit in a chair and ask you to stand up, not using your hands and walk across the office and they time you. Um, for that, that's, that helps know that you may need to have some muscle strengthening to increase your function and prevent falls. I just want to say again, falling is not a normal part of aging. All right, so if you've had a fall and your provider asks you, have you had any falls, and you decide not to tell them, that's not going to help. They need to know if you fell. I mean, we all do silly things and trip. But the thing is, a fall can really land you in the hospital and, and, and also possibly cause death. And they have statistics on that as we age. So it's not a happy thing to think about, but it's a reality. So you want to prevent any sort of following, falling as best possible in your own home and outside of your home. Regular visits with your provider is important. They are your, you know, they're on your side and they need to know what's going on. So communication is key. I also found out while I was looking at this presentation that May is Older Adults Physical Fitness and Mental Health Awareness Month. I know we're only, you know, two days from the end of the month, but you've had mental health uh, discussions in this series. So take advantage of that. Worry about yourselves. Take care of yourselves because you deserve it. And lastly, um, this is my mom. She, <laughs> this is Ginny. Um, Ginny, um, you know, my dad died in 2001. He was 83. And she lived alone for another three years, a couple miles from my house. And then all of a sudden, we started noticing changes. And she had Alzheimer's. And so she came to live with us. And she lived with us for 15 years until she couldn't anymore. Um, and then she went into long-term care where she got phenomenal care. And this is her. She went in at 98, age 98. And this is her 100th birthday. Um, and she was just the sweetest mom. Um, and the staff loved her. And she had a great time um, there. And, you know, as she progressed into dementia, she had lovely caregivers. And she died uh, right after we moved into our new home. She was 102. So I just want to say, you don't, you know, you can't predict how long you're going to live. So you want to maximize the time you have and be safe and work with your providers because it's really important because, you know, some of you, um, again, my husband, he comes up a lot. His, his dad died at age 50 of uh, a heart attack. And, you know, he was afraid as he was turning 50 that that was going to happen to him. And so now he's... I think he's 59, and um, he is, you know, very much aware of safety. Um, he has regular visits with his primary care provider every year for his, you know, his uh, exam, annual exam, and he sees a cardiologist once a year as well. So really important. It was hard for him, though. He was scared because he thought, I don't have a long longevity in my family. But that doesn't mean anything. You know, this is, you know, not going to be necessarily your normal. So really important that, you know, you stay safe and prevent anything. So your eyes, your ears, your feet are so very, very important and vital. So are there any, thank you very much. And are there any questions? Thank you.